I'm gonna be frank. The coverage and commentary from game journalists as it pertains to the Road to PS5 video from Sony has been the worst. There were a lot of things that were clearly stated in that video that, well, once it ended, the ADD robbed it away from people. It's been frustrating dealing with the bad coverage and hearing people criticizing this presentation for being technical. Instead of helping their audiences understand what was said in the video and what it means for the future of gaming, outlets have only added more confusion to the situation. In this episode of The Rant Is Go, I'm going to focus on clarifying things about the presentation and providing meaningful commentary about what was announced there. I've seen a lot of game journalists say this conference was a mistake, despite Sony making it clear exactly what the video was in their announcement tweet, the video's description as well, and even restating it at the beginning of the video. It was incredibly obvious what this was going to be, and anyone who says otherwise is blaming Sony for the fact that they aren't paying attention. While I can understand random people not understanding what those words meant, People who cover video games for a living should have a more reading and listening comprehension skills than an ADD adult eight-year-old. I've heard that overseas Sony's Twitter accounts phrased it, phrased this promotional tweet in a lot more vague of a way, perhaps implying that general PS5 info would be shown, but that was not the case in English. While I understand the anticipation for Sony to show PS5 games, pretending that this was supposed to do that when it clearly didn't set out to is ludicrous. It's just fueling articles about how Sony dropped the bomb with the PS5. Can they recover from this? And then later when Sony shows off PS5 games, they get to act like it's a redemption story for their journalistic angle. Something I feel a lot of people haven't understood the gravity of is the announcement of the solid state drive in the PS5. Sony announced the raw speeds of the SSD is 5.5 gigabytes per second. And the compressed speeds are eight to nine gigabytes per second. That is incredibly fast. It's basically as fast as DDR3 RAM and it's just the storage for your games. With this, they have effectively ended an era in game design that has lasted for 24 years. Ever since we made the transition from game cartridges, which basically act like local memory, to optical formats like CD and then later hard drives, games have had to stream data from the storage format to local memory before it could do anything meaningful with it. Since that transition, game devs have had to arrange data on the disk delicately to make sure the assets could load or stream quick enough. This goes back as far as Crash Bandicoot 1, where the levels would stream slowly off the disk as you traveled through them. And as Mark Cerny brought up in the talk, even Jack 2 arranged its open world environments with winding roads and paths, so that way the game had enough time to load up the next area before you could walk there. Spider-Man on PS4 is a much larger game than it had to be because they duplicated some objects in the game over 400 times just so the game could deal with streaming the data off the hard drive in time. So not only are we looking at games that don't need to waste as much space with redundant data next gen, but games next gen can also be seamless in ways they couldn't be before. Sony even did a lot of work making custom hardware to alleviate the CPU demands of streaming that much data off the SSD, which is great because as Mark Cerny said in the video, If all the overheads get 100 times larger, that will cripple the frame rate as soon as the player moves and that massive stream of data starts coming off the SSD. This really is a radical change to how games are made and Sony's solution is ridiculously powerful. The fact that they could accomplish this, but also allow for normal non-proprietary NVMe SSDs to be installed in the system is fantastic. This will make prices to buy extended larger storage much, much lower than if they have gone with a proprietary solution. Another thing, when Mark Cerny was talking about backwards compatibility, anyone who is familiar with how the PS4 Pro has a PS4 legacy mode would immediately look at the graphic presented on screen and heard what Mark Cerny said and understood that it meant games might be broken by unlocking the full power of the PlayStation 5, but the legacy modes would work just fine. In the video, Cerny says, even as the technology evolves, the logic and feature set that PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 4 Pro titles rely on is still available in backwards compatibility modes. Later, he says, Achieving this unification of functionality took years of efforts by AMD, as any roadmap advancement creates a potential divergence in logic. Now this is where he stops talking about the PS4 legacy modes that are in the PS5, and now he transitions to talking about the PS5 boosted mode by saying, running PS4 and PS4 titles. Obviously Mark Cerny meant PS4 and PS4 Pro because saying PS4 twice in the sentence doesn't make any sense. PS4 and PS4 titles at boosted frequencies has also added complexity. The boost is truly massive this time around and some game code just can't handle it. 
testing has to be done on a title by title basis. Results are excellent though. We recently took a look at the top 100 PlayStation 4 titles as ranked by Playtime, and we're expecting almost all of them to be playable at launch on PlayStation 5. If you notice what the slide shows and you heard what Mark Cerny said, he's talking about running games in the PS5 native mode with the boosted frequencies, the full power of the PlayStation 5 unlocked while running PS4 games. AMD already worked in the legacy modes that downclocked the system to run games like they originally did on the PS4 and PS4 Pro hardware. People's misunderstanding of this part of the video only got much worse when the PlayStation blog wrote a really weird abridgment of what was said on stage and thus reinforced the misunderstanding that only 100 PS4 titles have been confirmed to work on the PS5. I made a video the day the stream happened, clarifying what Mark Sarney said on stage in the presentation, and I caught an immense amount of shit on Twitter from bizarre fanboys who seemed to think that random game journalists in the PlayStation blog knew better than Mark Cerny did. To be fair, not a lot of people understands this subject matter, and Mark didn't phrase it like a feature list. He chose instead to talk about the complexities of back combat in a very intertwined manner. I understand why he did this, but nuanced context and technical know-how are not the strong points of modern gaming journalism. Days later, the PlayStation blog finally updated their statement to clarify that not only 100 games would work on the PS5 at launch. This whole thing has been a giant exercise in why you should handle your social media better for a situation like this and then stay on full alert to respond to any misunderstandings people have when something like this goes up. To me, it was clear what was meant, but people didn't understand and it was exacerbated by the PlayStation blog's own post and other game journalists. The last thing I'm going to touch on briefly here has been the bizarre comments I've had to hear about the power gap from games media. The gap in power is, on paper, 17.8%. Sony made note of a ton of ways they optimized to actualize more real-world performance from their teraflops number. Though you might be inclined to take it with a grain of salt since it's Sony talking about this, a couple of things to consider is that since Sony prepared this video well in advance of the Xbox Series X spec reveal, this is less of a response to that and more comparing to previously existing hardware. In fact, Mark Cerny brought up comparisons with prior generations very deliberately in the video. Also, what Cerny says about raising clock speeds versus adding more execution hardware is true. By raising the speed of the entire GPU, you accelerate many more parts than just the ALU performance, which is how we measure teraflops, and it'll actually help the system perform better. The power gap isn't as simple as what's on paper, and I would love to go fully in depth on that, but we're gonna have to do that in another episode of The Rant Is Go because it's way too much to cover in this one. I heard someone say that the PS5 is clearly less powerful than the Xbox Series X. Their reasoning, <clears throat> Mark Cerny referenced a PS5 game that only used ray tracing for reflections. Meanwhile, Microsoft already has Minecraft running fully ray traced. I thought this was obvious, but maybe it's not, so I'm gonna just clear some things up. Minecraft is an incredibly simple game graphically and is much easier to ray trace than anything remotely modern or AAA! Join me next time on The Rant Is Go when I do a deep dive into the differences between these two systems and then I wish for death when I read the comment section. This video was brought to you by the power of the legendary Gigaboots executive producer, Vincent Pover, Nicholas Cameron, E. Lee Broyles, Star Falcon, Spaceman Spiff, Danny Richardson, Dryzark, RedBlaze27, and Texas Man joins Smash. Thank you for lending us your power, our executive producers. And also these guys. If you want to become powerful like our executive producers, then head on over to www.patreon.com slash gigaboots today.